ใหญ่Good evening, everyone. We appreciate your presence. On behalf of the University of Texas Permian Basin, the Council, the Odessa Council for the Arts and Humanity and Latin American Friday Series, who made this activity possible, we would like to thank you. Buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Agradecemos su presencia. En nombre de la Universidad de Texas Permian Basin, el Consejo de Artes y Humanidades de Odessa y la serie de escritores latinoamericanos que hacen posible esta actividad. Les damos las gracias. Soy, soy Denise López Madrid, estudiante del programa de maestría de español aquí en Chiquibí. De verdad, es un grande honor tener aquí al escritor y profesor mexicano Gené Bertrand Félix. En un momento más, mi compañera Fernanda García Juárez nos dará detalles de la biografía y las publicaciones de nuestro invitado quien reside en la Ciudad de México. Las malas noticias hay que tomarlas como bien. No es grato saber que las agresiones verbales o físicas en contra de las mujeres siguen en aumento. No es grato saber que la mujer tiene que vivir con temores. En tristeza cualquiera darse cuenta que las mujeres aquí y allá son asesinadas por razones realmente absurdas. A mí como mujer me mortifica mucho este panorama de violencia por todos lados. Y nótese que la violencia contra las mujeres no es un fenómeno particular del México contemporáneo. Si no ha sido suficiente con la pandemia que nos ha cambiado la vida, la violencia contra las mujeres parece quitarnos el sueño porque se asemeja a una poderosa plaga que se multiplica tersamente, a veces de manera evidente y en otras muy a nuestro pesar, de manera sutil, casi impredecible. Esperamos que este fenómeno que estamos viviendo, por eso digo que las malas noticias hay que tomarlas como vienen, sea parte de la fase terminal del anacrónico sistema patriarcal en el que estamos viviendo y en el que hemos heredado. El tema de la violencia contra las mujeres se representa de manera nítida tanto en el cine como en la literatura. Abundan los ejemplos. Y no, importa, y no importa si son obras de ficción la que, las que exploran esta temática, lo que importa es el discurso y su impacto. De acuerdo con Roland Barthes, la ficción es el medio más apropiado para tratar relaciones complejas, desde que se admite que la ficción no reivindica ni lo verdadero ni lo falso. La lucha radica, en términos semánticos, contra el discurso que ordena y normaliza la violencia. Así que, profesor Beltrán Félix, su ponencia resulta de mucho interés para entender este fenómeno social y la manera en la que la literatura lo representa. A continuación, mi compañera dará la traducción en inglés. Hello everyone, good evening. I am Fernanda García Juárez, also a student of the master's uh, program in Spanish here at GBB. It is a great honor to have your presence and at the same time to be able to briefly present the biography of the writer and professor, Gene Bertrand Félix. Bad news must be taken as it comes. It is not pleasant to know that aggression, verbal or physical, against women continues to increase. It is not pleasant to know that women have to live with fears. It saddens anyone to realize that women here and there are murdered for truly absurd reasons. As a woman, I am mortified by this panorama of violence on all sides. Violence against women is not a particular phenomenon in contemporary Mexico. If the pandemic that changed our lives has not been enough, violence against women seems to take away our sleep because it resembles a powerful plague that it is multiplying tenaciously, sometimes in obvious ways and at other times, much to our regret, subtle, almost imperceptible. Let's hope that this phenomenon that we are experiencing, which is why I say that the bad news must be taken as it comes, is part of the terminal phase of anachronistic patriarchal system that we have inherited. The issue of violence against women is clearly depicted in both film and literature. There are many examples of this, and it does not matter if it is works of fiction that explore this theme. What matters is that the narrative discourse and its impact. According to Roland Barthes, Fiction is the most appropriate medium for dealing with complex relationships, since it is admitted that fiction does not claim either the true or the false. 
the fight lies, in semantic terms, against that discourse that orders and normalizes violence. So, Professor Bertrand Felix, your presentation is of most great interest to understand the social phenomena and the way in which literature represents it. Professor Bertrand Felix was born on June 4th of 1976 in Durango, Mexico. He lives in Mexico City with his two children. He has published three novels, Adios Pomasa, Farewell Pomasa in 2019, Cualquier Cadaver, and Any Dead Body in 2014, and Cartas Ajenas, Letters from Others in 2011. The short story collection, Habla de lo que sabes, Speak About What You Know in 2019, three books of essays on Mexican and American literature, Asombro y Desaliento, Algunos Cuentistas Mexicanos, Amazement and Despondency, some short story, Mexican short storytellers in 2017. El sueño no es un refugio sino un arma. Dream is not a shelter but a weapon in 2019. El biógrafo de tu lector, The Biographer of Miss Reader in 2003, and a collection of maxims and aphorisms, El Espíritu de Eli, Weak Spirits in 2017. His work has been awarded the Jose Vasconcelos National Prize for Essay in 2002, the Bellas Artes Colima Prize to the Best Narrative Work of the Year in 2015, and the Fellowship from the Sistema, Na Sistema Nacional de Creadores de Arte, National System for the Arts from 2015 to 2017. He also received a Fellowship for Young Writers from the Fundación para las Letras Mexicanas Foundation for Mexican Literature from 2006 to 2008, where he is now a lecturer in the narrative workshop. Currently, he is the executive director of the Casa Estudio Cien Años de Soledad, a new center for the promotion of creative writing located in a house where noble Castor Sigil Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote his, favorite, his famous novel, 100 Years of Solitude. Critic appraisal about Bertrand's work has been overwhelmingly positive. His most recent novel has been alluded as one of the most disruptive novels in recent times by Christopher Dominguez in El Universal. Bertrand presents with an ethical sense, intelligence, and talent, a deeply committed and strong writing that offers a path to represent and think on our difficult social system by Ignacio Sanchez Prado in Cofavorari. A novel spelled with capital M by Roberto Diego in Laberinto. This novel is about cruelty and violence, a high standard literary work by Belvio Peralta in Vienna. Sea usted muy bienvenido al profesor Jaime Bertrán Félix. Antes de su charla, el profesor Marlon Fick, cabeza del programa de literatura, expresará algunos comentarios sobre la representación de la violencia contra las mujeres en la literatura estadounidense. Luego, después de la charla del profesor Beltrán Félix, habrá una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Gracias. Welcome once again, profesor René Félix. Before, before his talk, we would like to welcome Professor Marlon Fick, Chair of the Literature Program, who will express some comments on the representation of violence against, wo against women in American literature. Following Bertrand's keynote talk, there will be questions and answers for the audience. Uh, thank you. Gracias. 
entitled to the age of innocence. Ooh, very good. Who wrote the age of innocence? Get it for them. <laughs> Let someone else have a turn. <laughs> Who wrote a book called Song of Solomon? Toni Morrison. Good. <laughs> I didn't see anybody raise their hand. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you've heard the title, The Color Purple. Oh, lots of hands. Good. Who wrote The Color Purple? Very good. I think that was Rachel. Point for Rachel. Light in August. Did I stop you? Ooh, the most violent, the most violent scene against a woman, between from a man toward a woman, appears in a novel called Light in August. A man named Joe Christmas cuts off the head of his lover. So we begin tonight with a trigger warning that we're going to be talking about violence against women. How about the title, Their Eyes Were Watching God? Mm -hmm. You know the author? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, a man, Zora first. Oh, yeah. How about Desire Under the Elms? Give a second clue. Also wrote Long Day's Journey into Night. Anyone? Hey, Keen on the other point for me. Who wrote Passing? Point for Penny. Nella Larson. It's a Harlem Renaissance figure. What about the bell jar? Sylvia Blast. A point for uh, Dr. Perry. The yellow wallpaper? We studied that today, so you better know that one. <laughs> okay, Charlotte Perkins. Point for y'all. I have just a few more names, but they're not literary figures. They're figures that, you know, part of our culture, people that we see on the news. You know. Raise your hand if you've heard of Harvey Weinstein. How about Jeffrey Epstein? How about Donald Trump? Anybody? Point. The thing about literature is that it, the form, whatever we're talking about, poetry or novel, our lives. So unfortunately the problem of violence against women in Mexico is not limited to Mexico, which is my, my little title in here. I stole from the Beatles, which you can't do by copyright. You know, they like, they'll get you. But the title is here, there, and everywhere. I went to high school in Paris. Some of you know this. I went to high school in Paris, France. And I was about age, I was age 16. And I met a girl in the park. I think it was in Luxembourg Gardens. We were in the park at Luxembourg Gardens. Beautiful, beautiful place. Maybe it was a belong, I don't remember. But I, we were, I sat down and said, can I, can I sit down on this bench with you? And she said, sure, you know. So I said, um, we talked a while. Uh, I noticed she had a black eye. So I, I asked her briefly, would you like to drink a beer? And she said, oh no, no, no. I, I won't go with, I won't go on a date with anyone. It's not nothing personal to you. After college, I, I wanted to 
you know, serve my country. So I joined the Peace Corps because I, you know, I wasn't sure I could actually shoot someone. <laughs> so I joined the Peace Corps and they sent me to live in a small village in the Congo to teach kids. One even, one of my 14-year-old students showed up at my mud waffle hut, bleeding everywhere. Her father had hacked her up with a machete. Fortunately, fortunately, we had a doctor in our village. This is a very, very rare thing in the Congo. So I scooped her up and I carried her to the doctor. She had over 300 stitches. Sometime after that, I moved to Mexico, not far from where Fanny lived. And I stayed there for 15 years. And I still maintain a home there. And my grandson is there, and my wife is there right now. Um, the poet, a, a mutual friend of ours named Octavio Paz, invited me to come to Mexico to read. I liked it in Mexico. I was going to be there a week. I liked it. I stayed. job pretty quickly after I got there for the, the English version of a newspaper, very much like the Wall Street Journal, it's called El Financiero, if you know the term. And this is a time when horrific things were happening at the border in Juarez. Women were disappearing and being found, packed into little pieces. So I went to my editor and said, please let me cover this story. Two journalists this week have already been murdered, just asking questions. So, while still calling Mexico home, I took a little hiatus too, because I was offered a job as an advisor in Pakistan, a couple years later, to be advisor to President Musharraf and uh, Professor of Women's College at the same time. I had roughly female students, graduate students, and in their journals and their essays, they often wrote, substituting the first person for the third person, the same way our poet Wallace Stevens says she when he really means I. So they're referring to themselves in third person. They wrote about how they knew someone who knew someone who had got raped by their cousin, by their first cousin during the Eid festival, or by their uncle, or by their father. That plus there was a war going on, in fact, the same war is still going on, uh, made it almost impossible for me to function. I needed to rest, so I took frequent trips down to India. I went to India to get away from the chaos and the violence and the pain. It's only in India I made a circle of friends who explained to me, oh, if your parents-in-law don't like you, they send you to cook in the kitchen or they'll turn on the gas in the kitchen until it explodes and you're no more. It's called, there's even a word for it, the kitchen death. Some time passed and I was invited to go to China. Guess what? Can I say the F word? No. Can I say the F word? 
get to China. Same fucking crap. I wanted to get a rest from China, so I went to Japan. Guess what? Same fucking crap. I came home to Mexico and met this wonderful woman named Lillian Vandenbroek, who I didn't know for a long time, because she came from this very illustrious Mexican family of one of the three great muralists in Mexico, Orozco, Siqueiros, uh, Rivera. Her great her grandfather was David Siqueiros. Awkward when you have Trotsky, granddaughter, in the same room with Siqueiros' granddaughter. That will be our inside joke. So I set out to translate her work. Actually, I set out to translate in order to learn the language of Spanish. And could you hold up that book for me? And it, this is the, the book that, that came out of that experience, The River's Wide. And it includes her entire book of poetry inside. The name of the book is interesting. The State of Anonymity. The State of Anonymity. If I were a great writer, I don't want to be anonymous. I want you to flow, I want you to throw flowers at my feet. Do you follow me? The poems by Lillian Vandenbroek are enigmatic. They, they, they remind me of Emily Dickinson. They're minimalistic. They're mysterious. They're cryptic. Why? To echo repression. Here's one little example, and I'm going to stop so that Penny can have all the time. In Spanish, it's called Agua y Fuego. Agua y Fuego. In esta pared, André, el ref. Regadero y la estofa estaba el clavo. Fue allí donde ello, ella colgó su diploma. Water and fire. There was a nail in the wall between the refrigerator and the stove. It was where, it was there where she hung her diploma. Please, please applaud for Henny. Good evening. I am very glad to be here tonight. Uh, I appreciate your presence here. I, I would like to thank the University of Texas Basin, the Odessa Council for the Arts and Humanities, and the Latin American Writers Series. For this invitation, I thank uh, Denise and Fernanda, Professor Mauro Fick, and Professor Antonio Moreno. Um, I'd like to start my lecture about this such topic. Uh, Violence, Women and Fiction in Mexico. Uh, this uh, lecture was uh, written originally in Spanish, and I thank Andrea Beltran for her translation. Um, throughout uh, 2018, Mexico registered 1,006 femicide victims. If that number is compared with the 426 victims in 2015, a 136% increase is observed. As shown by statistics, violence against women is a problem which has only grown in Mexican society. Nonetheless, 
the number of crimes that go unreported is very high, which adds to the perception Mexican citizens have of their justice systems as negligent and apathetic. All this situation cooperates to impunity. Crimes are not punished in Mexico. During the last few years, this topic has garnered more presence in the public eye thanks to the tireless political participation of collective groups of women, as well as a more extended knowledge in mass media about the national relevance of this problem. For the purpose of getting a closer look to the roots of such a complex and sad situation, I propose we look back into how different kinds of violence against women have been represented in different voices of the Mexican fictional narrative of the 20th and 21st centuries. This is neither an extensive nor a thorough review, but only a series of moments in an itinerary in which, from female writers' perspective, some evidence of the violence found place in literary representation with outstanding aesthetic features. This itinerary will better allow us to get to know the modes of literary art to approach such a sensitive problem with its tensions, conflicts, and injustices. Simultaneously, this approach shall result in understanding women's social and political struggles in Mexico's historic evolution, and also that have recently resulted in the presence in Mexico of the Me Too movement with reports of the violent and abusive behavior in the literary world as well as a place in the Iberian cities. It's convenient we start a journey with a writer who lived during the toughest years of the Mexican Revolution in the early 20th she is Mary Kamaldevi. She lived her early years in the midst of the battles that plagued the northern states of Durango and Chihuahua between the years of 1910 and 1917. She made her debut in 1931 with a book of short stories in which she portrayed the violence of the revolution in the city of Arrayo, Chihuahua, from a girl's perspective. Campobello explained to the critic Emmanuel Carvalho, I've written my books to answer to offense or to pay off debts. It uh, then seemed as if she didn't write for a sort of integral vocation or calling, nor for answering to an intimate need. We would talk about a Nelly Campobello, obedient to her rage and visceral feelings towards the historical reality. Francisco Villa was extremely popular in the north of Mexico. 
However, once the revolution most violent phase was over, Villa's cause was betrayed. And even Villa's assassination in 1922 did not bring an end to the press campaign that vilified his cause. On the contrary, the victory of his enemies, presidents Álvaro Obregón and Plutarco Villas, during the uh, decade of the 20s, gave way to newspapers and books painting Villas' tropes of brutal bandits. Against this interpretation, interpretation of history by the government and the press, nearly Campobello had her truth, the truth of the defeated. This is Nelly Campobello's short story collection, Cartucho, Cartridge. Cartucho depicts Villa's soldiers' stories, executions, escapes, shootings, always tragic deaths, and presents these soldiers as human beings with light and darkness within. They are brave, idealist, shy, and they are also cruel, blood thirsty, mean spirited. Each of them with a name or a surname, at least a nickname. There are generals like, like Villa himself, uh, Tomas Urbina, Rodolfo Fierro, very famous generals of the uh, army uh, led by Villa, but other characters are very young and nobody knows a word about them. Only we know about them thanks to Nelly Campovillo. One of them is called Cartucho, Cartridge. The role in the battle is only recorded within the pages of this book. Little is known of them. Each of their biographies is a page and a half long, maybe two. The central part of each story is the death of the soldiers. After Cartucho, Nelly Campovello published a short novel. Las manos de mamá, my mother's hands. While in her first book, Cartridge, Campobello addressed the violence experienced in the streets of Parral during the Mexican Revolution, her novel approaches a more intimate and painful topic. The mom, the mother, in this story disappears one day, leaving her two young daughters alone. When she returns, she faces the threat of losing the girl's legal custody. And then this woman declares that her absence was not voluntary, but instead had an atrocious reason. She was abducted and raped. In this way, in Las Manos de Mamá, Nelly Campovey closes the circle of violence representation she started with cartridge. If her first book was about violence in the streets of a city in the north of Mexico, her second one, chillingly tackles violence against women in the social disorder from the revolution. In the face of the military's justifications, which spoke of justice and democracy and national pride, Nelly Campobello notes the full picture of reality in a heartbreaking and moving particular his, his story. Unfortunately, Nelly Campobello's work is brief. 
She dedicated herself mostly throughout her life to dance. She was a dancer, young. She was a choreographer and a civil servant. Her own ending was chilling. Nelly Campobello was abducted and murdered in 1986, when she was 86. Her remains were not found until 1998, 12 years after her death. It is not strange then that violence is so present within her patients, for it was so painfully present in her own life. These are the two editions of the collected works by Nelly Campobello. Miss Libros, my books, was published in 1860, and Ora Reunida was published 20 years after her death. The, fall, the, the next name I will focus in on during this journey is that of one of Latin America's most prominent literary figures. Her name is Elena Garro. Born in 1816, Garro became known first as a playwright with un hogar solido, a solid home. 1957. And afterwards, she published a novel. In 1963, Los Recuerdos del Porvenir, Recollections of Things to Come. And as a short storyteller, she uh, became known with La Semana de Colores, Week of Colors, in 1964. The time in which Garro be became known is referred to in history book books as El Milagro Mexicano, the Mexican miracle. Violence in the revolutionary country was left behind and decades of economic and political stability were lived in the 40s, 50s, and 60s thanks to a process of centralization of power in the executive branch and an industrialization guideline that gave, gave way to migration from the countryside to the cities. Elena Garro grew up in the southern city of Iguala, in the state of Guerrero, a region heavily agitated by the Guerra Cristera between 1926 and 1920. Nine, a warlike clash between the government's armed forces and Catholic groups. The Guerra Cristera, the Christ's War, was a taboo subject in Mexico's recent history, but Garro addressed it in her first novel. In it, we have a kind of communal narrator. It's the people themselves, the families who, li who live in the fictional town of Ixtepec, who tell the story. And an important aspect in Los Recuerdos del Porvenir, in Recollections of Things to Come, is the representation of relationships between men and women. In the first part of the novel, the relationship between General Rosas, the leader of the military forces who imposed their law in the town, and Julia, his lover, stands out. He is jealous and possessive. She is by his side against her will. Nevertheless, the town blames her for the general's atrocity who supposedly ordered his enemy's execution as a way to get rid of the frustrations he feels every time she refuses to correspond to his expressions of love. To put it in a cheesy way, he owns her body, but not her soul. She gives the impression of evading him spiritually, never confronting him, and this exasperates Rosas. When an outsider comes to the town of Ixtepec, tragedy ensues. That man, that man seems to be from 
Julia's past. He is her heart's true owner. In the second part of the novel, Recollections of Things to Come, we have another great important female character. Her name is Isabel Moncada. She is the daughter of one of the traditional families in Ixtepec. Her brothers decide to join the rebel forces against the federal army, but she becomes the new lover of General Rosas. While violence and repression worsen, she is regarded as a traitor towards her family and the town of Ixtepec. Thereby, the novel's two female characters seem to receive the worst accusation by Ixtepec's inhabitants. In the violent Mexico that resulted from the revolution, it seemed that there was not a way to be a woman without committing a crime. Garro shows an extraordinary knack for storytelling as a narrator, an admirable stylistic, stylistic force and a complex character building capacity. Los Recuerdos del Porvenir is considered a classic in Mexican literature, but only recently has it been regarded as such in the context of Latin American literature. In other of her short stories and novels, Elena Garro made a critical representation of machismo and violence against women. Among her various works, she offers a fatalistic panorama of Mexican women's lives between the decades of 1920 and 1960. These women find uh, no peace or harmony at home, for they live with their parents, husbands, lovers, or family members who abuse and suppress them. They cannot develop professional lives because society does not have spaces for their education or work. So, living in a patriarchal society, women in Garros fiction are hidden by the contradictory nature of home as the space as a space that nurtures and suffocates. As critic Lucia Melgar states, calling attention to the close mood towards the feminism of this critical posture in Elena Garro's fiction, Garro grasped a new how to show the complexity of being and becoming a woman in a society and tradition that deny female liberty, eroticism, and desire. Apart from her contributions to narrative fiction, Elena Garro excelled in uh, the drama art. One of her plays is titled Los Perros, The Dogs. The topic in the dogs is rape. In this play, a mother experiences in her youth the assault that awaits her daughter as soon as she reaches adolescence. That is to say, violence in this case against indigenous women seems to be a sentence passed from one generation to the next. In Los Perros, the dogs, young Ursula asks her friend Javier about the intentions of a man who is rumored to be planning on abducting her. Does Geronimo want to skin me? And Javier answers, that is what he wants to leave you in the flesh so that the wind hurts you, so that you leave a trail of blood everywhere you go, so that everyone sees you as the one without skin, the wretched, the one who cannot go near water or heat, nor sleep in peace, 
with any other man. It is surprising that in a time when, when very few authors addressed these topics in Latin America, Elena Garro gave place in her literary imagination to such a powerful and critical expression because she puts the rent phenomenon in a sphere of facts that goes beyond a single person and includes its relationship with society. Elena Garro is part of the Mexican galaxy of talents that marked the second third of the 20th century at one of the most refreshing times from, for Latin American literature. The group of authors born in post-revolutionary Mexico was benefited from years of social peace altered from time to time by conflicts in the la labor sphere or in presidential elections, and above all, the birth of institutions form a network of education, encouragement, support, and commentary. The Fondo de Cultura Publishing House, El Colegio de México, the College of Mexico, a graduate university, the National Institute for the Fine Arts, the Mexican Center for Writers, the Revista de la Universidad de México, the Review of the University of Mexico, and many cultural supplements. It is true that this new uh, policy that benefited the writers in Mexico applied especially for Mexico City and other few state capitals and boosted mostly male children of middle and upper classes in the uh, important city of Mexico. Elena Garro was not the only author to address the link between machismo and racism. Another writer who stood out in the second third of the 20th century in the literary field with a similar proposal. Her name is Rosario Castellanos. She was born in 1826 in Mexico City and died in a domestic accident in 1874 in Tel Aviv, Israel. She uh, is well known in Mexico as a poet, short story writer, novelist, playwright, essayist, and journalist. Castellano was the most vehement thinker about women's situation in Mexico, as seen in her essays in the book Mujer que sabe latín, Woman Who Speaks Latin. Her reflections about Virginia Woolf and Simone de Beauvoir's ideas gave a valuable boost to the spread of feminism in Mexico. In 1871, she wrote about inequality. She said, it is not fair that one can be owner of his body and can make use of it at his fit, and at the same time, the other hides her body, not for her own interest, but so that it is used for processes against her will. Uh, Rosario Castellanos wrote a novel, uh, not only one, but I am going to speak of a novel. Uh, uh, her, its title is Balloon Canal. Balloon Canal is set in the southern state of Chiapas during the 1930s. It tells the story of a girl in a wealthy family who knows discrimination for not being a boy. But Alucanan also deals with the lives of the indigenous population who have known racism and exploitation from the white minority of Spanish descent for centuries. The main character even when older, was replaced or overshadowed from the moment her 
brother is born. And so she soon learns the lesson of his pretended superiority over any woman. This dynamic is shown with a simple episode. She tells us, and I look over my brother from head to toe, for he was born after me, and when he was born, I already knew many things I now explain carefully to him. For example, Colón discovered America. Columbus discovered America. Mario looks at me as if the merit was not mine and shrugs with indifference. I am suffocated by rage. Once again, the full weight of injustice falls on me. Emotional and psychological violence that comes from being raised in a society that hates a human being simply for being born a woman is reflected also in Rosario Castellano's poetry. She wrote, I write because one day, as a teenager, I looked at a mirror and there was nobody. Do you realize? Emptiness. And by my side, everyone was brimming with significance. Sadly, Castellanos died before her 50th birthday when she was serving as the Mexican ambassador in Paris. One can assume her literary work would have kept on blossoming. Oh, I'm sorry that there is the, uh, um, a sentence from Rosario Castellanos. Another way of being in this world. Uh, that's a, a verse from a poem by Castellanos where she reflects uh, that being a woman in Mexico uh, requires another way of being in this world. I would like to focus now on another author who also knew how to portray the problems women face in Mexico from a perspective ahead of their time. She is Inés Arredondo. She was born in 1828 in Culiacán, Sinaloa, in the northwest of uh, Mexico. Daughter to a talented doctor, Arredondo left her native city to do a major in Spanish literature at the National University of Mexico. Her work, unlike Garros and Castellanos, is brief. She wrote only three books of short stories, as well as some few essays, reviews, and studies in literature. She debuted with La Señal, the signal in 1865. She published as well Rio Subterráneo, Underground River in 1879, and Los Espejos, The Mirrors in 1888. In such a compact work, Arredondo made way for a series of topic, topics usually absent in Latin American literature sexuality and desire, abortion, abortion, incest, rejected motherhood, repressed homosexuality, or femicide. One of Arredondo's most shocking stories is entitled Mariana. The main character, Mariana, is a teenager who falls in love with a young boy, Fernando. This is against her wealthy family's wishes, especially against the wishes of her abusive father. After the teenagers are wet, Fernando behaves abusively and possessively. He wants her to be devoted to him. His efforts to control her are unstoppable. He says, 
a fury, a never-ending need for possession blind, blinded me, and there is where my insanity began, as they call it. The story tragically ends with Mariana murdered and Fernando committed to a mental institution. And thus this place must be a name of owning not only a woman's body, but her spirit and will as well. Uh, these are two photographs of Ines Arredondo. The first one is in her native city, Culiacán. This is the Culiacán River, what you can see. And the other one is in Mexico City, where she lived uh, the last uh, years of her life. Uh, she died in 1989. In the same year as Ines Arredondo's birth, Amparo Gabriel was Amparo Dávila was born in Pinos, Zacatecas, in northern Mexico. She wrote poetry, but she is better known because of her three short story collections. Features of Amparo Dávila's fiction descend from European fantastic short stories from the 19th century, displaying a direct and transparent, transparent prose her stories represent the evolution of a character when routine is altered, but by the arrival of a sinister entity that affects everything all the while, revealing itself as a projection of their internalized destructive impulses in, a, in an unfolding of psychological terror. A topic that stands out in Amparo Dávila's stories is that of the female condition in a society where their only option is marriage and raising children. Not being able to bear the weight of the, de of the demands, nor even fulfilling the smallest of expectations, a wedding, leads Davila's female characters to a state of alteration and breakdown that translate into the apparition of that sinister. For example, a short story, Musica Concreta, Concrete Music. This short story gives title to the 1964 volume. Marcela is the main character. She has found out that Luis, her husband, has a lover. Faced with the fear of seeing her marriage cover in front of her eyes, she makes out in a toad's croak outside her window the menacing figure of that trespassing woman. Based on her amphibian features, resembles a condition close to animality. Marcela tells a friend, I saw her the day she was with Luis, the same cold, inexpressive eyes, a face too big for her short height, stuck on her shoulders with no neck. In Marcela's view, this woman had the power to transform herself into a toad, to torment her into madness with her croaking at night. It is not imagination, it is not a dream, it, uh, it is not my nerves, as you call them, says Marcela. It is a chilling, disquieting reality. It is being so close to death that one feels its cold to the bone. It seems that without the security of marriage, all of Marcella's existence would lose value until trusting her into a state of danger. Divorce would be hell. There is another short story by Amparo Gavila, El Huésped, The Guest, from the collection Tiempo Destrozados, Destroy Time, 
1959. Here we have a housewife who summarizes her condition. We had been married for three years. We had two children and I was not happy. My husband saw me as a piece of furniture when you get used to seeing every day in the same spot. The husband is always absent. He is either traveling or he arrives home really late. So distant, he always gives orders and so gives her wife the order of accepting the presence of a guest. And this guest makes life in that house hell. This entity is barely described. Big yellow eyes, almost round and blinkless, which seem to pierce through people and things. And this guest is shown as a quiet energy, an entity situated in that border between the animal and the human being. So this guest could be understood not only as a real being, but as, as the corporeal extension of the fury hidden in a woman had been treated so degradingly. Yes, there is another short story by Amparo Davila that I find really interesting. It's called Tina Reyes. That's the name of the main character. Tina Reyes is a single woman who once is stopped on the street by a man. Uh, she fears he will try to attack her. In this uh, short story, the underlying topic is something very serious for Tina Reyes. Peer pressure, like marriage and economic su success, is embedded in the individual psyche and the ill warps its view of reality. Tina Reyes, for example, goes through life with an imminent feeling of failure and sexual dissatisfaction for not being married yet. She thinks, it is such a shame, such bad luck, that this boy, so well crafted, withered in the shadow of loneliness, not knowing a single curse. I have stopped. These are the three short story collections by Amparo Davila. figures of the 20th century with the purpose of observing how the diversity of issues in women's life in Mexico point to a general injustice, inequality, lack of opportunities for personal and professional development, several kinds of violence from verbal to emotional to physical and sexual. And certainly this list does not end with this author's work. There is, for example, another author, Elena Poniatowska. In her work, we find a constant examination of women's situation in Mexico, either in non-fiction writings, interviews, novels, or short stories. Poniatowska has been a warrior that, with great public success, has condemned Mexico's patriarchal reality. Her novel, Hasta no verte Jesús mío, Until the day that I see you, Jesus, or the short story collection, The Noche de Mío, by Mike are examples of a will to mix literary creation with social criticism. 
This is Poniatowska's fair novel, as far away to Jesus Mio, that's a, a very popular expression. Uh, we can translate it as, as the legend that I see you, Jesus. And the first short story collection is this, The Noche Vienes, by Night You Come. In El Limbo, Limbo, a short story published in The Noche Vienes, uh, we find the story of a girl from a wealthy family in Mexico City at whose house a housemaid secretly gives birth to a baby. In this story, the approach to the topic is not black and white, but, but critical. Uh, it is the same way as Monica, the main character, as and looks until she finds in a corner wrapped in newspapers a tiny red parcel, a loose substance, a tiny head with black hair to this school. In this book, the author herself typifies her stories as it happened with her journalism, with a will for movement and inquiry which made her step out of a bowl similar to the one she grew up. Ponya Tosca descends from Poland's royal family, she would have been a princess, and also from a privileged and cosmopolitan family in Mexico City. And she captures the way this wealth influences in the lives of Monica. Monica becomes the protagonist in Limbo because she takes the newborn to a hospital. The main character, Monica, is conflicted by the idea of being a part of the problem because she sees in her family episodes of racism and frivolity. She thinks it is so easy, so easy when just eight blocks from here, there are many poor children dying. And so she seems not to accept the reality of vulnerable women abused by injustice because she expects them to take the challenge of living marginalization through political action. The young woman's encounter with apathy, with apathy and suffering makes her question her place in the world. This viewpoint, which Poniatowska shares with Elena Garro and Rosario Castellanos, can be seen in other stories from the Noche Vienes, like Love Story. The title, uh, the original title, is in English: Love Story and La Casita de Soloy, but I don't know how to translate into English because it is a very popular expression. La Casita de Soloy. It is like a cheesy way of referring to a happy family, to a happy house, a happy home. Um, and the story is about a housewife who is uh, disappointed because uh, she has many children and no time for herself. And so it is um, a parodic or a humoristic title. Um, the generations of Mexican female writers that followed have played out with new research the purpose of criticizing machismo. At the same time, they show an ambitious aesthetic will. Before I speak about them, I will uh, refer to the government that still lives. He is um, 87, I think. And uh, she is uh, 87, and she is writing lots and uh, taking part in many uh, issues. She writes every week for La Jornada newspaper, so she is very active. Uh, she is admirable because. Uh, she has. Uh, she is not only very talented, but uh, hardworking. And so, I would like to um, mention briefly some another uh, literary figures. Uh, 
Writers, Monica Gavin, eh, who was born in 1959, Ana Clavel, 1961, Veronica Murguía, 1960. They have written novels and short story collections. Eh, they made themselves known in the last years of the 20s century and they are still producing literature and there is also another generation of female authors born after the 1970s decade. Uh, here you can see Fernanda Melchor, uh, Liliana Bloom, Nadia Villafuerte and uh, Julieta Garcia González. Uh, Julieta Garcia González was born in 1970, Bloom 1974, Villafuerte 1977, Fernanda Melchor is the, younger, uh, the youngest one, 1982, and they have explored topics such as sexual abuse against girls, abortion, femicide, domestic and psychological violence, etc. Uh, Fernanda Melchor's second novel, Hurricane Season has become uh, maybe the most successful novel uh, published in Mexico in any time after the case of uh, Pedro Paramo, the most important novel published in the 20th century by Juan Rufo. Important to mention before we finish another fact. In 19, I'm sorry, in 2019, Social networks registered a high number of reports of abuses committed by male writers against their female colleagues under the hashtag MeToo Escritores Mexicanos, MeToo Mexican Writers. These reports, mainly made anonymously, highlighted a harmful pattern of violence some even going to physical attacks and rape, which and their inherited privilege and taking advantage of their authority as teachers, editors, or public servants, several male authors had committed over the years. This uh, phenomenon has been a positive sign. In a broader context, the Me Too Escritores Mexicanos emergence is framed in a series of debates and measures that already existed in the literary world in Mexico. For example, books written by scarcely known authors from the 20th century started being reprinted by Mexico's most important publishing house. Fondo de Cultura Económica, a prestigious institution that during the first decade of this century, when Consuelo Sizar was its general manager, included in their catalog works by the following female authors. Elena Garro, Enriqueta Ochoa, Esther Seison, Josefina Vicens, Melica Cubello, Elena Poniatowska, Margot Glantz, among others. This was significant because Fondo de Cultura Económica, during its previous seven decade trajectory and presence in various Latin American countries, had garnered a canonical, consecrated place including this female author was an act of justice that allowed newer generations to get closer to texts and works that had stopped circulating or circulated in marginalized spaces. It is true there is a lot left to do. I was writing these lines in a difficult moment in the feminist fight against the established authority in Mexico. A politician with several sexual harassment accusations is a candidate for the post of governor 
of the state of Guerrero in the south, and he has received the explicit support from the President of the Republic. In this instance, the explanation has been about the presumption of innocence of this politician. At the same time, the President of the Republic, López Obrador, who, is, uh, who has high popular support ratings, has declared without any proof that women's tests against that candidate responded directly to a partisan logic from the opposition parties. In this way, he has disregarded the demand from women all over the country. These women, with good reasons, have expressed their annoyance in the face of impunity, simulation, and lies coming from government institutions. I mention this situation to give an idea as to how, regardless of progress and the repercussions this topic has had in the public arena in Mexico, many difficulties are still present in society and government institutions. Thank you very much. libros de venta consigo por si alguien está interesado en comprar. En este momento el tiempo está abierto para si alguien tiene alguna pregunta o un comentario. Thank you very much, Professor Gene Beltran Felix. It has been a magnificent talk. Um, we did want to make the announcement that he did bring some of his books um, and they are available for purchase in case anyone's interested. Um, at this moment, does anyone have any questions or comments that they would like to make? Thank you. Uh, uh, there are uh, many colectivas, that's a name that they gave themselves. Instead of colectivos in the male form in Spanish, uh, these collective groups of women uh, have uh, been working in the last decades, supporting women who have suffered from domestic violence, a shelter, uh, who need uh, legal advice for divorcing or for um, finding a new life after a disastrous uh, marriage. And in the last uh, governments, the last administrations, uh, these feminist associations had received support from the Mexican state, from the state. And uh, in this way, they could uh, uh, help many other women uh, because the state institutions didn't do that. And because of this experience helping women in a dangerous situation, uh, is that we know that they know what is happening with uh, women's situation in Mexico. And so the lack of representation of feminist 
associations in the um, in today's administration is because uh, the political parties are not open to uh, include as candidates uh, the leaders of these collectivas of these collective groups. Um, and so um, the uh, main uh, feature about this is uh, present in Mexico City and some few other cities in, in Mexico. Um, and they are uh, usually small groups that um, are, um, don't have a powerful presence in the press or in television because there is a prejudice in general in Mexican society against, um, against feminism. Uh, many uh, professional women uh, in social network, networks, for example, uh, write, uh, they post, uh, I don't need to be a feminist to be a happy woman, for example. So that's a problem of the representation of the feminist struggle in Mexican society uh, because of the association of uh, activism as a way of progressing politically. So if you are an activist, it is not because you try to help society, but because you want to be to have power <laughs> to get. Uh, political space and uh, now many uh, uh, journalists think that the main opposition to the administration, to the federal administration is the feminist collectivas, not the opposition parties. So, the, the, but this is uh, dismembered, they are not making a political party, they, are, they don't have this uh, presence in, in the political arena. successful and why writing movements 
there's one in Mexico, Grupo de Cien. I think they really are not successful. Um, why are they not successful? Is, uh, there are movements in our country, um, Black Lives Matter. There's another movement called the Poor People's Campaign. If we want to galvanize someone, you really have to have a central figure. And now, Black Lives Matter is on everyone's mind, but we don't have a central figure. So, so when the marches were happening throughout the summer, and I know this is intersectionality, I know it's not about the violence against women, but it is super important. So when you have a Dr. Barber figure, you have people who are ready to follow. Because you have a leader, you have a clear leader at a national level. But the Black Lives Matter is suffering for not having that one figurehead. And I think that's happening in Mexico City. Do you agree? Um, yes, but I don't, I'm not sure that having a leader uh, would be the solution because usually uh, a figure, a leader, polarizes. There are people for or against. And leaders uh, can make mistakes, can betray uh, his or her followers, and that um, harms cause, the political cause. Um, it took two generals to win the Mexican Revolution. We talked to early on about Pancho Villa, but we didn't say anything about Zavita, Zapata, who fought all the way from the south to me. Uh, yes, and these two generals, uh, Francisco Villa in the north and Emiliano Zapata in the south in the Mexican Revolution, did not want power. Emiliano Zapata did not want to become the president of the Republic. And one, and there is a photograph of General Villa and General Zapata uh, in, in, the, in the National Palace, yeah. in, in, the, in the chair of the president. You know? And, well, we don't know if it's true, but uh, he said that Zapata said, we should burn this chair. It is such a big temptation. Habría que quemarla. It is better to destroy power than to accept the temptation of power because it is very easy to betray. We had the same men. I mean, we, we had the same men in, 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 the, in George Washington. Right. He writes a farewell address. Simone Bolivar. Uh, is thought to have modeled his his uh, campaigns after George Washington. Uh, whether he would have given up power, we don't know, because all the letters and things he wrote were burned. There's a marvelous book by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Como Someone, The General in His Labyrinth, in which he reconstructs the biography of, of, uh, of Simone Bolivar. So, I, but I think that, I think you're right. I mean, what I'm saying is that you're right. But, but except that I would just say that we do need leaders. We just need multiple leaders and not the same. So I agree in a way. However, I, I remember that Simone Yes, well, that the figure of mother 
mother is very important in Mexican cosmology. You know, the word madre, mother in Mexican Spanish has many meanings. It, it can mean many things. You have many so shoot. Many idioms. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can be something very good and something very bad. Um, but the, the problem is that uh, changes, social changes are very slow, at least in Mexican society. I don't know if, if in the rest of the world uh, the speed of the social changes is. is uh, it seems to be slow everywhere. Mi tu mamá está bien. No, it, it, I agree. No, it's it's really slow. That's why when when I had my my tiny little paper you know, next to this giant, that tiny little paper's point. The point there is is that I saw machismo in Pakistan, China, and France. I saw machismo everywhere. Mexico didn't invent machismo. Uh, it's a human illness the way it's the same as racism is a human illness. So uh, your your comment about respect is that's where that's I hope the takeaway from all of this, right? And so and 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 we need to diversify our curriculum, uh, particularly particularly in Mexico. I am a student of Mexican literature a little bit. I'm not next to him. I'm a pea. I'm the size of a pea. Because I tend to read only the poets. I think of many of the writers he's talking about. I know Castellanos. I know Enrique Ochoa. Ochoa. But but some some of the others I don't know at all. Because it's, frankly, it's, it takes a long time to read a novel and it's a very short time to read a poem. And I, I have to say that it was difficult uh, when I was very young, when I started reading in my teenage years, to find uh, works written by women in libraries uh, and in the bookstores. And that's why I mentioned this um, measure in the Fondo de Cultura Económica, in the most, most important publishing house in Mexico, uh, because suddenly you could find the novels, and poems, and short story of uh, female writers who are really interesting, who are really talented, but because they were women, they were less known than male writers. And this uh, is not fair. Talent is the most important is the gift of a writer, and it doesn't matter if the, we are speaking about a male writer or about a female writer. And the, there is a difference. The way these female writers wrote uh, was more sensitive about women's issues than what. I don't know, Octavio Paz or Juan Rulfo is a set about women. There, there, there is a, a difference that, for example, as a writer now, I, I have learned lots of, for example, Elena Garro. When I wrote my novel, uh, Farewell to Massa, I was reading and rereading Elena Garro uh, because even though I grew up with uh, my mother, with a sister, with different women in, in my family. Uh, I have been educated in a machista way. Uh, I was uh, a spoiled male uh, child, a uh, boy, like my brothers. <laughs> and so uh, this was a re-education, a, a new way of uh, seeing things. And that's a miracle of fiction that enables us to see life from a different perspective. And so you understand many new things about yourselves and about the society you have been living or about any other society because 
these experiences are universal? Except on, on, on the, yeah, they, they are. Except on the issue of acceleration, is, is, is progress is being made faster in one place than another? I, I, think, I think clearly here we're making faster progress. Uh, and I know that, I feel that because uh, even my publisher, one of my publishers, uh, who now refuses to publish anyone but women, they received a letter of congratulations from presidential candidate Hillary Clinton when they made that change. We are no longer going to publish men. At least for a period of time, 10, 20, 30 years, who knows. So, so there's a concerted effort in the commercial world of book production, which is usually on the uh, which is usually on the forefront of cultural change. Right. So yeah. it's accelerating. white males you know, and he and then when they found out that one of the persons he published with a Chinese female name was a pseudonym well we don't blame George Eliot for writing with the name George so so but I think there's there's going to be some growing pains and pushing and pulling and and, and tugging uh, so you, you know so it, it's just it's I'm okay with it, frankly, but I don't count. When, I mean, I sit on an editorial board, and I don't care about who, the gender of who's publishing. La impunidad es el gran problema. Eh, muchas personas no denuncian los crímenes porque pues, piensan que no va a pasar nada. Eh, el cambio solo va a venir de abajo hacia arriba. Y creo que si es un cambio lento, las nuevas generaciones de abogados, de policías, eh, pueden a tener otra perspectiva eh, por eso es una cuestión de eh, no callar de, de no caer en el silencio para que no exista el pretexto de que no sabíamos eh, y por ejemplo en el ámbito editorial lo he visto. Ahora hay más mujeres dirigiendo editoriales en México. Hay más mujeres dirigiendo instituciones, asociaciones de cultura. Y evidentemente que la vida es distinta, es, es más inclusiva. Eh, lamentablemente es lento ese cambio, pero el, el gran problema son las instituciones de justicia sistema penal, ahí es donde la desesperanza es enorme y no tengo realmente la respuesta, sino más bien la esperanza de que las nuevas generaciones van a eh, ir cambiando eso ahora es, es muy triste, realmente es muy decepcionante el presidente de la república es antifeminista viene de un partido de izquierda se suponía que la izquierda apoya a las mujeres, apoya el medio ambiente y no es cierto. Está destruyendo el medio ambiente y está atacando a las mujeres, tan solo a no defenderlas.
this uh, wonderful journey of these powerful women. And I think it is true because this woman has given voice to the voiceless. And uh, I think one solution is to read, definitely. Because uh, these novels uh, teach us from the heart. And that is what's, what's uh, going to change our perspective. And I'm so happy to see these new generations, like my daughter, my nephews, that I think they're changing because we as women also have the solution. We are the ones that can make our song become what we, what we would like to be for them to become. So we are the ones that can teach them how to treat a woman, that everybody has the same equal rights, and uh, definitely comes from the mother. So, but I really appreciate all this journey, it's wonderful. And, and the fact that there are men in the audience here, exactly. or women. <laughs> Usualmente las escritoras son menos conocidas, previamente por mis alumnos. No, por, solo saben el nombre. Y ya que las leen, eh, quedan sorprendidos y se preguntan por qué no las habían leído. Por qué no las habían conocido. Eh, Elena Garro, creo, es la más importante escritora mexicana del siglo XX pero sus libros no se consiguieron. Muy pocos, los recuerdos del porvenir se podían encontrar. En librerías de segunda mano encontraba algunos libros, pero no, no se reeditaban. Y cuando uno le preguntaba a alguien, a un editor, a un escritor, no son tan buenos. Eh, en la primera novela nada más es la buena. Y era una forma de descalificar, de, de no recomendarla. Eh, y entonces uh, ha sido más fácil estigmatizar o descalificar a las escritoras por sus rasgos personales que lo que ocurre con los varones. Un escritor puede cometer muchos errores, puede cometer crímenes y lo seguimos leyendo. Y Elena Garro tiene una historia muy, muy convulsa, muy difícil. Fue esposa del poeta Octavio Paz, que llegó a ser premio Nobel de Literatura, se divorciaron, se pelearon. Ah, hizo unas declaraciones políticas en el año de 1968 sobre el movimiento estudiantil, que la colocaron en el lado equivocado de la historia. Y había gente que, que la rechazaba por eso. La cancelaron. Cancel Culture eh, acabó a Elena Garro. Eh, y el, la reeducación esa exigía recuperar su obra, volver a ponerla en circulación. Y las jóvenes que van a tomar talleres, que quieren ser escritoras, descubren a Elena Garro y se sienten reivindicadas. Ven un ejemplo de una escritora muy talentosa y eso las impulsa. Eh, y la, digamos, la, la finalidad entonces es uh, hacerle justicia a la gran escritora, pero también enriquecer a los, a los lectores y a las lectoras.
¿Hay alguna otra pregunta? Thank you very much.